Let me read to you a passage from the 12th chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, verses 8 to 12. It's the Gospel for Saturday of the 28th week of Ordinary Time. St. Luke writes, Jesus said, I tell you, whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But he who disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. That's from Luke chapter 12, verses 8 to 12. In those words, our Lord refers to the Holy Spirit. As is well known, Islam places Muhammad at the end of a long prophetic tradition beginning from Abraham, and indeed from Adam. Its holy book, the Quran, is said to be the final testament. I do not get the impression that the numerous inspired books making up the Hebrew Bible, what the Christian calls the Old Testament, and the books making up the New Testament, especially the Gospels, are used in practice by the Muslim as an important source of access to Revelation. Rather, the Quran, with its own summaries and comments and interpretations of the Old and New Testament events and teachings, is all that is needed and acknowledged by the Muslim in practice. Virtually, it is complete in itself, the Quran. So it is regarded. Muslims believe the Quran to be verbally revealed through the angel Gabriel from God to Muhammad, gradually over a period of approximately 23 years, beginning in 610, the year 610, when Muhammad was 40, and concluding in 632, the year of his death. Muslims further believe that the Quran was precisely memorized, recited, and exactly written down by Muhammad's companions after each revelation was dictated by him. The present form of the Quran text is accepted by most scholars as the original version compiled by the first caliph, Abu Bakr. Now I say this as an introduction to the contrasting Christian approach, which of course does not allow that the Quran is among the inspired writings, nor that Muhammad is one of the line of prophets. In Christian teaching, divine revelation in a public sense was concluded definitively in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is everything and contains in himself every heavenly blessing, as St. Paul writes. However, the Christian, like Christ himself, steeped in the Gospels and in the New Testament writings, looks lovingly and constantly to the Old Testament also. The Church is always referring to the revelation that preceded the coming of him in whom dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Church lovingly treasures the first glimmers in the Old Testament of what is gradually being revealed there, and which bursts into full view in the person and teaching of Jesus Christ. The person of the Spirit of God is a case in point. The idea of the Spirit of God is not, I think, found in Hellenistic thought. It is a biblical theme. The Spirit of God meets us in the opening verses of the Old Testament, just as it does in the first chapter of the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 1, verse 18. It is then no more a startling novelty for the author of Genesis than it is for Matthew. But of course, while it is common to both Testaments, the number of references to the Spirit of God in the New much surpasses the number in the Old. The point here, though, is that there is a manifest continuity between the two. Jesus Christ and the writers of the New Testament speak of the Holy Spirit as a divine person and they identify the Holy Spirit with the Spirit of God of the older books, which they, especially Christ himself, venerate so highly. 
the doctrine that God revealed himself gradually and progressively to his chosen people over the course of history is constantly assumed and it is endorsed by Christ himself in his constant references to the scriptures. He is their fulfillment and their interpretation while far surpassing the mere letter of those inspired writings. So it is that the church takes the Hebrew scriptures very seriously and looks to them for fuller appreciation of what the Saviour revealed. When our Lord refers to the Holy Spirit, then, as in today's Gospel, let us immediately set his teaching within the context of the whole sweep of divine revelation, though this is not something I have the space to explore in detail here. In our Gospel today, our Lord refers to the Holy Spirit with the utmost love and reverence. The enormity of an offence against the Holy Spirit is stressed by our Lord, indeed to the point of declaring that anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Just what our Lord is referring to here has been variously discussed, but it puts us on guard about profound reverence for the divine person of the Holy Spirit. Our Lord also tells us that the Holy Spirit will be the greatest and fondest support for the Christian in his mission. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Luke chapter 12 verse 8 to 12. Let us resolve to love the Holy Spirit as does Jesus our Saviour himself. He is God, the same one God that the Father is and that the Son our Lord is. He is a distinct and living person, a divine self that is other than the Father and the Son, the self who proceeds from the Father and the Son as their mutual love. He, his divine being is their divine being, which is the one and only God. He, the third divine person, is the one God as is the Father and as is the Son. And his mission is to sanctify the church and each of the church's children and through the ministry of the church with Christ her head to sanctify the world. Let us entrust ourselves to him, to the Holy Spirit then, and be led by him.